It is my joy to introduce to you the preacher of the evening, a sister, colleague, bishop friend, Bishop Latrell Easterling. She is the first woman bishop to lead the 233-year-old Baltimore Washington Conference. It was about time they got a woman. <laughs> I know that because that's my home conference. Bishop Easterling was elected a bishop in the United Methodist Church just this past July in none other than Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> we had a good time there. <laughs> and she began serving the Baltimore Washington Conference in September. She's actually a native of Indiana, the state of Indiana. She worked as an attorney and she worked in re human resources but she saw the light and went toward the Methodist Church ordination process and was ordained a deacon in 1995 and an elder in 1997. And then she ended up in the Boston area and served the Union United Methodist Church. And later on, she ended up as a superintendent in the Metro Boston Hope District at the New England Annual Conference. And she actually became the dean of the cabinet there as well. She is a person of great faith a wonderful leader, and she has a lot of degrees, like a bachelor's degree from Indiana University, and a summa cum laude degree in Masters of Divinity from Boston University School of Theology. But she is indeed one of the most spirit-filled people I know. We haven't known each other very long, but she is filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's my joy and privilege to introduce to you to her now, and she sends greetings from her reverend husband, who is Marion Easterling, Jr. He's a pastor at the West Grove Church in Hanover, Maryland. And the Easterlings have two sons, Garrett and Miles. So please give a warm Eastern Pennsylvania greeting to my sister bishop, Bishop Latrell Easterling. Body preacher, so watch out, okay? <laughs> Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Well, there we go. <laughs> to my sister, Bishop Peggy Johnson, what a blessing you have been to me as I have come into this office. I want you all to know, you know how wonderful she is, but you don't know about the little things that she takes the time to do. She takes the time, even though, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So because God has given her so much, God has given her two conferences to lead. Also, her shoulders are broad, and I know that she leads you well, but she also takes the time, she and Michael, to go and visit their colleagues around the jurisdiction. When she invited my husband and I to dinner, we were just so touched, and we went and broke bread with them, and it was phenomenal. And then before I was able to preside over my first annual conference, I received a package from her, and I said, what could this be? And it was a loving note letting me know she was praying for me as I was about to take that seat. You don't know what that meant to me with all that she has to do and all of the things that are before her that she would take the time to reach out in that kind of loving way. Thank you and God bless you. You have a phenomenal woman leading your conference. And to her husband, Michael, who makes my husband not feel so strange as a male spouse of a bishop. <laughs> it's something because, again, as you know, they're not that, I mean, there, there are a lot of women, but not that many. And so most of the spouses are female. And so when Marion could look at Michael and say, whew, okay, somebody I can hang with for <laughs> while I'm walking this journey. So God bless you, Michael, for all that you have been to Marion to Dr. Powell, the Dean of the Cabinet, and the one who made sure I got here in good order and time. God bless you and thank you. To all clergy persons, to any other distinguished guest, and to the laity, let us hear this word of God from Philippians, the second chapter, the third through the 11th verse. As I read 
the Spirit invites us to listen for the Word of God. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God Almighty. That is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Gracious and omnipotent creator, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer, speak, God, for your servant and your people are listening. Amen and amen. I give myself away. I give myself away. We are all familiar with Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Well, the scripture that I just read to you was Paul's letter from a Roman or an Ephesians jail. The commentators continue to argue about that location, but nevertheless, beloved, one thing is clear. Paul was behind bars and writing under the weight of a capital sentence when he penned these words to the church at Philippi. Although the church fathers of the 4th and 5th centuries exhausted themselves on what this letter meant in terms of its ecclesiology, in terms of its Christology, Christ's divinity and humanity, below that is not the crux of the letter, huh? No. Paul was writing to the church at Philippi to discuss those who called themselves Christ followers and how they were to live. Paul was offering a tutorial on living for Jesus 101, huh? Uh, or as the mothers and fathers of the church used to say, if you're saved, you ought to show some signs, huh? Jesus, huh? The second person of the Trinity emptied himself and took on the form of man. Oh, but he wasn't done, huh? No, he emptied himself again and became like a slave or a servant. But wait a minute, then he emptied himself yet again. He emptied himself of all life. He emptied himself of every breath. He emptied himself unto death, even death on that cruel, rugged cross. If the Son of God could relinquish his divinity and his privilege and his power and his authority and all that had been given to him since the time of creation so that we might live, how much more can we relinquish that we might serve the Son of God Almighty? Now Paul is quite clear in this passage that Christ is not just an aspect of God. No, he's talking about the Christ that was God and was with God, huh? The Christ that was with him at the beginning of all things that ever were. Christ, as we Methodists believe, truly God and truly man, distinct and yet inseparable, one in essence and power with God. And yet Paul makes it clear that Christ did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own aggrandizement. Huh? No. Beloved, Paul is explaining that Christ did not hold on to that which was his, even though he had a right to, for it was his birthright, his essence. No, he didn't hold on to it for his own sake. He gave it all up for us, for the sake of our understanding. He offered his deity in service to others. He gave 
himself away. I have a dear friend, Reverend Dr. Zena Jacques, who also graduated from Boston University School of Theology, and she imparted wisdom to me that has saved me on numerous occasions. Huh? Dr. Jacques shared with me that one day when she was confronted with a difficult situation, one that tested her to her very core, she had to ask herself, do I want them to see me? or do I want them to see Christ? In that moment, she was able to let go of that 10-pound can of whoop that she was carrying and take on the mind of Christ. Huh? This scripture tells us that when Christ emptied himself, God used him to offer himself to the world so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. God. Now, beloved, we need to be real clear and we need to really understand that knees will not bend nor bow in honor of who we are. But we also need to understand that we can either invite or block others to know Jesus the Christ. We must ask ourselves, do we want to bring others to Christ or do we want to block folk from knowing who Christ is? Because we need to understand, for some people, we are the only word of God that they will ever see or read. We need to understand that we, through our living, we, through our serving, we, through our loving, we, through our preaching, we, through our visiting, we, through our very being, huh? we are the word come alive for some people. And we need to ask, what kind of word do we want them to see? You are the paraphrase, huh, that will come and sit at the bedside. You are the one that will sit in meeting and at table. You are the one. And when they look at you, you need to ask, are you an invitation or a stumbling block? It is quite a conundrum, though, isn't it? Huh? We acquire titles and degrees and authority and power as we navigate our way to this very hour. Huh? The hour of commissioning and ordination all the while following in the footsteps of one who willingly gave all that up and humbled himself literally to death. What does that mean then for us? Well, it means that if you need your ego stroked while you serve, this is not the right call for you. <laughs> if you need titles bestowed upon you and read from lofty places, huh, then you chose the wrong door. If power is what turns you on, then right now let us turn you off because you won't be serving anybody except yourself. Jesus gave himself away to everybody he met. He held nothing back. Now I'm not advocating that you work yourself to death. You ask anybody who serves with me, I believe in self-care. I believe in taking care of your family and I believe in sometimes just spending time to think. But oh, we have to give ourselves away yet still in this life called ministry. And if you do it with an attitude, people can tell. If you do it grudgingly, people will know. If you do it with an ulterior motive, it'll come through. If you do it with no love in your heart, people will be able to tell it. And so we do have to be willing to give to give, to walk humbly, to serve, to do it all without ever counting the cost. I give myself away so you can use me. You know, I often hear people quite proudly extol that they are willing to die for somebody. You ever had somebody tell you that, I die for you? You know, I'll take a bullet for you. I'll, I'll die for you. A lot of folk like to tell their spouses that, you know, I'll die for you. Well, it's a noble thought. But I have to tell you, in my 53 years of living, I've come to understand that sometimes it would be easier to die for somebody because you only have to do that once than it would be to live for them. <laughs> huh? 
Oh yeah! It would be easier to die, huh? In a fit of frenzy, huh? I might take a bullet, huh? In a fleeting moment, I might be willing to die for you, but to live for you means every day I have to get up, day after day after day after day and recommit myself, huh? And argument after argument and bad time after bad time and low budget and no budget, huh? I have to recommit myself to you. I tell you, beloved, it's harder to live for somebody than it is to die for them. And that's what Jesus the Christ was asking in this scripture. I died for you, he said. You don't have to die, but what I want to know is will you live for me? And if our answer to that question is yes, then what we're really saying is I give myself away so you can use me. The great pacifist and the mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, is quoted as saying, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Gandhi made this observation as he was fighting for justice for the native peoples of India because the so-called Christians that he encountered were nothing like the Christ that he read about in the Gospels. It is often easier to talk about an idea or a person than it is to really imitate them. We must ask ourselves, are we imitators or imposters? An imposter is one who claims to be something or someone that he or she is not. But an imitator is one who strives to be like the one that he or she admires. And for us, it's more than just admiration, huh? We have entered into a sacred and holy covenant. A covenant, huh? Better than a promise. Well... All right, now better than a contract because we're always looking for the exit clause of the contract, huh? Prenuptial agreements and everything. We want to know how we can get out before we even get in. But this is a covenant. And God said, even when you're unfaithful to me, I'm going to be faithful to you and wait for you to just come on back home. Huh? Today, you who are being commissioned and ordained, must ask yourselves, as I continue to lead and to serve, am I going to be an imposter or an imitator of Jesus the Christ? Our founder, John Wesley, understood the battle that you would have to wage, that we all have to wage with the ego, with the self, and with the world. What it would take to have the mind of a servant, it is not easy. You know, Bishop Johnson did tell y'all I graduated summa cum laude, so I, y'all know I, I'm not unintelligent, but I'm going to say it this way. It ain't easy today. Huh? Not in today's world. Not in 2017. Not in this, you know, I'm going to get you before you get me because I ain't going to let myself get that kind of world that we live in. Huh? Instead of, uh, 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 of coming with the Holy Spirit, some folk come strapped and ready for battle, huh? They come with a heart of war instead of a heart of peace. Oh, it's not easy in today's world because if you come gently and you come softly and you come loving you, huh? Lovingly, they say, ooh, we got one. Oh, we can take advantage of that one. Huh? Look at that one. Right for the picking. But John Wesley understood what it meant to have the mind of a servant. And so he offered us this Wesleyan covenant prayer as a means to disabuse ourselves of any haughtiness or arrogance or need to be lifted up, huh? This Wesley covenant prayer. If you don't say it often, I invite you to do so on a regular basis. Bishop Peter Weaver, when he was leading the New England Annual Conference, would say this to us. He would speak it into the atmosphere all of the time. And those who served with him when you got ordained or commissioned, he would write this prayer in the shape of a Celtic uh, cross and give it to you, huh? So that you might hang it on your wall, so that you might have a lot of occasions to repeat it. I know you know it, but we're gonna, I'm going to say it again just so we can hear it at this moment. I 
am no longer my own. I'm yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. That means when you get that call to go to that church way out there, you won't have an attitude and tell the district superintendent, you must have the wrong number, huh? No. <laughs> put me to doing, put me to suffering. We don't want to talk about suffering much anymore in this day and time. We like lives of ease and lives of comfort, but it's not always going to be comfortable on this road. And John Wesley understood that. He said, let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. That means if somebody doesn't call your name, huh? You got to remember, do I want them to see me or do I want them to see Christ? Well, praised for you or criticized for you. Beloved, if you can't take Get out now. Get out now. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, I am yours. So be it. That means there's no turning back. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be in heaven. Well, Bishop, you really came all the way to read that to us. We know about that. What are you ultimately trying to say to us, Bishop? Well, I'm going to get real with you, saints. Let's break it down, huh? Let's let the rubber meet the road. Commissioners and ordinance, you've got some long days ahead and some very weary nights. Give yourself away. There will be people who question everything about you, even your very call. Give yourself away. Some appointments or assignments may seem menial in your eyes. You're going to think they're beneath who you are. Give yourself away, huh? Decisions made in the duly called meeting that was held inside are undermined and undone in the meeting in the parking lot outside. Give yourself away. When you preach what the Holy Spirit has deposited in your spirit rather than what their itching ears want to hear and all the tithers stop giving their money, give yourself away. When you face racism or sexism or ageism or ableism or heterosexism or good old fashioned I just don't like you ism, give yourself away. I hope it never happens, beloved, but it happens to some of us. Your spouse may walk away from you because they wake up one day and say, you might have been called, but I wasn't. Give yourself away. The day will come when you want to tell everybody where to go and how to get there, including the bishop. Give yourself away. And I pray. That as you serve and as you teach and as you preach and as you sing and as you live and as you go about being the saints that God has called you to be, that you will always be people who invite them to Christ and not repel them from Christ, that you will always, with every ounce of your being, give yourselves away. <laughs>